Top of the day to you. This is Andrew Glazer from the Glazer Tutoring Company, and today I would like to teach you how to graph the following polynomial function of x minus 3 cubed multiplied by x minus 2 squared. So uh, it turns out we can kind of do three basic things to get an idea of how to sketch this graph. All right. So one is going to be to determine the end, what's known as the end behavior, behavior of the function. And the end behavior of the function is it depends on what form you have. So here we have this in fully factored form. All right, so to find the end behavior of the function from the fully factored form, what you have to do is you just have to simply add up the powers of each factor. In other words, find the total what they call multiplicity. All right, so if you were to add those exponents together, three plus two, you would get a value of five. Now what's important about the five is whether, or this number, whatever it works out to be, is whether it's odd or even. And obviously five is odd. Now that tells us some information about the end behavior, which I'm gonna to get to in about two seconds, okay? But that's one piece. Then we have to identify whether the leading coefficient of this thing is going to be positive or negative. Now, this will turn out to be a uh, quintic type of function where it's x raised to the fifth power somewhat, you know, if you were to do all the math out. Um, and the leading coefficient, what I'm talking about there is the coefficient of that x to the fifth power. Okay, what it is, whether it's positive or negative. Okay, now since we don't have it in that form, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look to the beginning here and see if there's any negative signs that are indicated. And if there isn't, if there are no negative signs indicated outside of the factors, then we can assume that the leading coefficient will be positive. Okay, so that's what we need to know in order to determine the general end behavior. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for odd function and positive leading coefficient. So I go to here and this is kind of a little bit, in terms of, you can memorize this, but I mean, you don't have to memorize it. You can understand it by plugging in some of the values and you'll just see that the functions will trend in these basic directions, depending upon whether you have an odd degree or an even degree. All right, and we have an odd degree and we have a positive leading coefficient. So this is going to be the end behavior. All right, so I go to here and I just start I'm going to plot like two points. I'm going to plot a point down here, plot a point up here, and I know the graph is going to go on, you know, in those directions on and on forever. Okay, that's the first piece of the puzzle. The second piece is going to be to find the x-intercepts. Okay, now how do we find the x-intercepts? Well, it turns out that it, well, it definitely depends on what, you know, you have, but you have to get the function down into factored form. Now, this is already in factored form for us, so that is a great thing, okay? And then once you do, once you get this into factored form, you take the factors here, the values inside of those parentheses, inside of the exponent there, all right? And you're gonna set those values equal to zero. So you're gonna do x minus three equals zero, and you're gonna do then x minus two equal to zero. And why are you doing that? Well, the reason why you're doing that is because, oh, I can even just ask you, I mean, just look at the function, right? Um, what x value here, what x value, would this, would you need to plug in, all right, what number, in order to make this factor go to zero, right? I mean, you're like, oh, that's so simple, Andrew, it's three. Yeah, right, and this whole thing is zero, that's zero, and zero cubed is going to be zero, and zero times whatever the heck this is, when x is three, I could care less what it is, I mean, it's going to be one, but it doesn't really matter, the whole thing goes to zero, and that by definition, and then we have the function's value equaling zero, and that by definition is what an x-intercept is. It's some place on the graph where the function's value or the y value is zero. In other words, the point lies along the x-axis. That's it, okay? So that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. So to solve this now, you can simply then add three to both sides, right? Add three to both sides. So x is gonna be a positive three. That's one x-intercept. Uh, all right, and then the second, why didn't that go into a full colored box? There we go. And the next one is going to be, you're gonna add two to both sides and X is gonna be equal to a positive two. All right, so we have some behavior, all right? We have some points of interest here. So let's say that this point represents the positive two and this one will represent the positive three. Okay, the graphs should now either cross or bounce off of those points, okay? Now what I wanna do though, and I realize that I'm probably gonna need more room, so let me let me move this on over a little bit. Okay. So we'll move this, maybe that's negative two there. Yeah, that looks about right. Negative two and then that's negative three, okay? Now, 
The next thing I want to do is I want to identify now not only those x-intercepts, but I also have to then identify the local behavior around these x-intercepts. You know, does the function cross the point? Does it come up to the point and bounce? You know, does it come from the top or from the bottom? And now this is easily found from looking at the multiplicity or the powers of each individual factor, okay? So the factor here of x minus 3 had an odd multiplicity, odd. It has an odd power, okay, ODD, odd. And the x minus 2 factor had an even multiplicity. Now when you have odd multiplicities, they will cross the x-axis. When you have even multiplicities, they will bounce or bump, okay? They will bounce or bump. So the idea now is this, that when you solve for your x-intercept of positive 2, right, that came from this factor, and that factor has an even multiplicity, and therefore we should expect it to be a bump. So when we look at our negative, uh, our intercept at positive 2, we're going to expect a bump. Now either the bump is going to happen, the bump looks like this, either the bump is going to be from the top or the bump is going to be from the bottom. Now which one should it be? Well, you're basically going to look towards your end behavior. Now remember that the end behavior of the graph is going to finish on off down here somewhere, and somehow this point is going to have to connect to that point somehow. Now if you were to expand this graph on up, and let's say bump it this way, the problem is now you added another x-intercept. But when we did the algebra, we said we should only have two. So there's no way it's going to come from the top. It has to come from the bottom. It's going to do a little bump down there. Okay, it's going to do a little bump down there. So what I'm going to do is maybe move this over a little bit. This is going to come up, and it's going to bump this and come back down. Now, when we look at our intercept at x plus 3, we realize that came from this factor over here, and that factor has an odd power, and it should cross then that x-axis. So basically now what's going to happen is it's going to come back, and it's going to cross that point now. There's only one way to do this, right? If it trails on off down here forever, it's never going to cross that point, right? So you're basically just playing like connect the dots now. Right? It's going to cross that point, and then it's going to go straight up to that point, and then continue on and on and on forever. So this is the basic way the graph will look, okay? Now it turns out that there's going to be a little bit of interest going on here where the graph is going to come up and it's going to flatten a little bit there, all right? And then it's going to finally take off. So let me try to make this a little neater, all right? And the, you might say, well, okay, how did you know that it's going to flatten off a little bit there? Well, that's just because, you know, a lot of time, a lot of this is through experience also. You know, when you have something raised to the third power, uh, it not only intersects, but it becomes a little flat there. It's like a cubic function, right? You might say, oh, right, a cubic function looks something like this, right? You know, where it gets a little flat when it crosses that x-axis. So, yeah, that's kind of how I know. But uh, you know, a lot of it is just through kind of experience, but that's the benefit of practice, okay? You got to practice this. I mean, there's no way, you know, if you think I just <laughs> I just picked this up one day, and be like, oh, yeah, this makes a whole lot of sense. I could just, no, it takes a lot, a lot of practice, all right? So stay determined. And by the way, the more you practice, the better you're going to get at it. And guess what? The better you get, the more you're actually going to enjoy it. Okay? Nobody likes sitting down at, let's say, let's say you don't play an instrument or the piano. Nobody likes sitting down at a piano who can't play the piano. Right? You just sit there. You hit the keys. It's like, okay, great. I made some sounds, but it sounds like absolute garbage. It's not very motivating. Right? But if you stick with it and you stay determined, right, and you have that little bit of determination at the beginning, okay, to get through when it's a little difficult, and then you're able to start now composing a song or a piece, right? It actually becomes enjoyable then. You want to play because you, you, you know how to play. And then you're going to wind up studying more. And then you're going to get better at it. And it's just going to become so much easier. All right? So just stay determined. If it's difficult, practice more. I promise it'll become easier. And you'll actually begin to like it. All right? Uh, and keep that in mind, now, this isn't only true with math, but it's true with anything you do in life. And therefore, it's important that you follow what you're interested in, okay? Because you're going to want to spend, or you won't feel like you're spending as much time doing what you're doing, all right? And you're going to want to pursue that. So definitely in do what you like. And if you don't like what you're doing, one of two things, either try to get better at it through practice. You got to stay determined. You got to have the willpower to do that. Or just drop it and do something else, right? One of the two. Okay, enough of the sermon. So, finding the y-intercept. What do we have to do? So, we simply rewrite the function. So, this is going to be k of x 
is equal to x, x minus 3 cubed multiplied then by x minus 2 squared. Now, you don't have to use this. Okay, you can just plug in y there because it, I don't know, it makes a lot more sense. I like y. I don't like h of x or k of x or f of y, whatever the heck it is, right? Um, in any case, what you need to do now is you want to solve for the y-intercept, and how we do that is by plugging in 0 for x because we know that the, um, we know, what am I trying to say? We know, we know that wherever the function crosses the y-axis, the x value has to be equal to 0, all right? I mean, that's just like the definition of it. Now, you can already tell from the general behavior of this function what's going to be the sign of that x-intercept, do you think? What do you think the sign's going to be? Well, the sign's probably going to be some negative value, right? So let's hopefully it works out that way. Let's see what happens. So y will be equal to 0 minus 3 cubed. Make that a little neater. And then there's going to be a 0 minus 2 squared. Now, this works out to be negative 3 in here, and negative 3 cubed is going to be a negative 27, right? The sign stays the same. Negative 2 is what's in here, but then you square it, so that's then going to be a positive 4, right? A positive 4. Now when you multiply these two together, you're going to get a negative 108. And that's your y-intercept, but that's what we expected it to be in terms of the sign, right? I know I'm on the right track now. This is going to be negative 108 somewhere down there, okay? So that's this is now the we we got everything okay we have we have the basic idea you know whether this thing now comes down lower and then makes its turn who the heck knows at this point we're just trying to sketch it okay we don't necessarily have the tools necessary yet to kind of develop those ideas I mean you can but uh, you know I think where you are in this class if this is the question that's being asked probably a little bit premature to start finding out the values of the local minimums and the local maximums but. Um, what you can also do is go check yourself, right? So plug this function in, just do x. Now you can use your calculator if you want. I mean, you could use it before and cheat a little bit, but I highly suggest you don't do that. Um, so, you know, kudos to you if you did not do that, if you tried to just do the algebra here. So go to zoom, go to standard for now, just to kind of get a picture. And as you can see now, it doesn't really give me a lot, a lot of detail there. It almost looks like it's pretty flat, right, in and of that area. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom into this region. You can kind of see already, though, that this thing's going to trail on down. And eventually it'll touch, you know, somewhere at the bottom at negative 108. It's going to intersect that y-axis. But let me zoom in here a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my window. Let's go to minimum of 0. Let's go to a maximum of 3. And I'm really going to zoom in. I'm going to go to y minimum negative 1. And let's go to y max of 1. And now graph it. Right. Okay. So I should have... I don't know why I chose 3. That was really kind of silly. I should have I should have chosen, let's go from 1 to 4, because the interesting point is at 3. And so here you can kind of see it now, right? It's very exaggerated in this picture, okay? And again, that's not kind of the point here. You're just trying to get a sketch, a feel of what's going on. This will definitely bounce. As you can see, it's bouncing there, right? You definitely see it bouncing a little bit. Um, and so I'll even zoom into that a little bit more, right? I'll go to let me go to uh, window. Let me minimize. Let me even make this. Let me go to negative 0.5. And let's just go up to 0.5. Uh, that's 5, Andrew. 0.5. Not negative. How are you going to go from negative to negative? Doesn't make any sense. 0.5. There you go. Graph. So you can start to see it definitely bumps there, right? You can definitely see that it's bumping a little bit. And then it's going to cross and come back up, okay? So we have the basic idea. Guys, thanks so very much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. I do hope this helps. And if it does, if you can like and subscribe, that would help us out tremendously. Maybe even tell some of your classmates. We really appreciate your support very much. And uh, by the way, check out our channel because we have thousands of videos, not only in mathematics, but physics and chemistry as well. So if you like the way we approach things, where we take specific problems and we show you how to solve them, we show you how to think through them, uh, then you're definitely going to love the other videos we have because that's what we do, right? Uh, we take specific problems. We teach you how to problem solve through them. Because at the end of the day, that's what's going to be on your exam, right? And not only is that going to be on your exam, but remember, solving a problem on the exam is similar to solving a problem in life, okay? So you're going to have very similar tools. Obviously, you might not need to know the end behavior of the function to solve a particular problem. But to know what you need to know in order to solve the problem and to know what you don't need to know to solve the problem is definitely very important. Um, 
Okay, I had my sermon earlier. I'm not going to give you another one for now because, uh, honestly, I don't even want to hear myself talk anymore. So, uh, anyway, I bid you farewell. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you soon.